almost done with, well, so we're pretty much done with theory in this class. So all we're doing now is just like design problems, okay? See, so we've got all of the, all the tools in our tool bag um, or toolbox or whatever we're using to carry our tools around. Uh, and we're ready to design now, ready to do root locus design, which is actually a, a really powerful way of doing control, controller design. And uh, I, uh, I'm really glad that we got this far in this class because I think you guys will, you guys will be greatly benefit. You guys will greatly benefit from having learned this um, as you go off in your careers. So, root locus design. Um, our ta and in root locus design, our task is to place the dominant closed loop poles such that the closed loop system is first of all stable. Okay, so pretty big prerequisite. It's got to be stable. Yeah, I didn't send out this page to you guys. I'll send this out to you. I don't know why I didn't send out this page. Um, oh, you do? Okay, good. Oh, yeah, that's right. So first off, the closed loop system better be stable. Okay, so you got to put the closed loop holes in the left half plane somewhere, right? That's the first requirement. But that's, I mean, once you're stable, obviously, there's a lot more to it than just being stable. So second requirement is that it has desirable transient response performance characteristics. So we want this thing to respond in a way uh, that makes sense in time. So percent overshoot, uh, settling time, rise time, those are the types of performance characteristics that we're going to design for. Uh, and then three, it should have a desirable steady state response as well. So we want small steady state response, or, or steady state error, right? We don't want to have a bunch of error in the steady state. We learned how to analyze for all of these performance characteristics, but we didn't learn how to design uh, systems that perform in a certain way. So now we're ready to do that. Um, so several types of controllers can be designed using these techniques. The most basic is gain control, which is 6.2, which is something we'll cover today, um, uh, which is uh, gives us a single parameter, the loop gain, for controller design. So we can just adjust the gain, and we can move along the root locus, and we can get something to happen. And it isn't always going to work for us, but that's like the, the bare minimum controller design. We'll do that today. Um, the other types we consider are of two main types. So the proportional integral derivative types, the so PID types, is one. And then the uh, proportional lag lead is the other sort of class of, of, um, d of controllers that we'll look at. So we're, today we're going to do the P, um, which so the proportional part, which shows up in both of these, so the proportional part is what we're going to talk about today. And then they kind of diverge, and they, the PID side goes, does integral and derivative, and then the, the lead lag side does lead and lag. They're very analogous, and we're going to learn about them both. Um, so these are, the, these, these are the types that we're going to discuss. Um, they're very similar, but the proportional lag lead can be implemented in passive circuits, whereas the, the PID ones require active circuits. Um, to, so you need to have uh, external power. But you, you can design a la uh, lead lag compensator, so a proportional lead lag controller, um, with just capacitors and inductors and resistors. So that's, that's, what, that's the sort of the, the main advantage of them. Uh, whereas if you wanted to do a PID, uh, you would need like an op amp with some external power in there. So those are the two main types. Uh, but first off, we have to cover um, how to find the gain from the root locus, which we saw a little bit of in the last chapter, but we want to, I wanted to go through and very uh, explicitly talk about it because we 
are going to need to be able to do this. It's one of the sort of key moves for doing controller design. So in what follows, we'll be primarily concerned with locations on the root locus that yield transient response characteristics. But knowing the location on the root locus at which we would like to operate requires that we know the implicit gain associated with placing the closes and pulls at that location. This lecture demonstrates two methods of finding the gain associated with a given location of on the root locus. So there's the analytic way of doing it, um, uh, and there's the geometric way, which is to, sort of tied together to it, analytically and geometrically. Uh, and then we'll, we'll do the, the easy way with MATLAB. Uh, so we'll start off, though, with uh, recalling from lecture 5.2, which was the definition of the root locus. Um, and we define the root locus magnitude criterion to be, got to change my brush again, to be that KGH, so the open loop transfer function, when you have a gain controller in there, um, is equal to 1. That was the magnitude criterion. The, the, the magnitude of the open loop transfer function is equal to 1. So wherever this is true, we're, we have locus, right? We're on the root locus. Uh, if we solve for the gain, k, we obtain the following result, that the gain is equal to 1 divided by the magnitude of g of s times the magnitude of h of s. Um, so this is a solution, an analytic solution for the gain. So if we have a given point on our root locus that we care about, and we plugged in what that value of s was, we would get a gain associated with it. So it's like, I, so I don't know who's whispering, but like I, 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 I feel like it's kind of kind of uh, 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 distracting, so try to keep the whispering down. Uh, thanks. You can shout, it's fine. It's just the whispers <laughs> got it, yeah. Uh, okay, consider this in terms of the gain K, P, pulls PJ, and zero ZI of, of GH, okay? Equation 6.2 can be written as a function, so this is equation 6.2, uh, mm -hmm of a test point psi on the root locus. So if we chose a point on the root locus psi, uh, then we could write the gain as a function of psi is equal to, you remember this uh, way of thinking about things, with the, the product of all of the magnitudes of the psi point minus each pole, pj. So the magnitude of each of these vectors, we like to think of it as being a vector from, from pj to psi, uh, divided by the magnitude of this is a little k, so I'm going to try to draw it a little differently. Little k, um, which is the gain of gh, right? So the gain of gh uh, times the product of psi minus zi. So as we discussed before, we obtain the geometric interpretation. The gain, so k, big K, is equal to the product of the lengths of vectors that originate at zeros and terminate at the test point, divided by the product of k, the gh gain, uh, with the lengths of vectors that originate from the poles and terminate at the test point. It's illustrated in figure 6.1. So if that was hard to parse, this hopefully will be a little bit easier to parse. <laughs> 
So, I'll make this a little bigger. So, we have a root locus in green. This is just like some root locus that I made. So the root locus is in green. Um, our poles, we have three poles and we have one zero, open loop zero. And so our root locus is like that. And if we were to look at this equation for the gain, um, it would be the product of these pole vectors, so the vector from each pole to some test point psi on the root locus. So say we wanted our closed loop poles to be located at one of them at psi, okay? We want one of them to be at psi, then we want to know what gain is associated with that, right? Because this, as we vary the gain from zero to an infinity, the closed loop poles move from these open loop poles to open loop zeros, right? That's what the root locus is showing us. So we're going to move along this curve. So we want to know what gain is associated with a given point on the curve. Um, we can use this formula. So you could <coughs> find the lengths of the vectors from the poles, the open loop poles, to this test point, um, and divide it by the product of the uh, length of the zeros, um, the, the zero vectors. So this is vectors from from the zeros to the test point, and then also divided by the magnitude of of the the gh gain, which is little k, and that gives us our gain. So the reason we go through this is to get a little bit of intuition on it, um, but it's also to so if you were like on a test and you were given a root locus plot and it said, what is the gain uh, to make your closed loop poles here, here, and here? Um, uh, then you would, you would have to, um, one way you could estimate what the gain is is to actually draw these vectors and find the lengths of them. So that's, you just do it all graphically. Um, yeah, so that's that's how to do it analytically slash graphically. Okay, is that way. And now we're gonna do the easy way. Okay, so that was the hard way. Here's the easy way. So finding the loop gain k that yields a closed loop, uh, a closed loop pole at a specific point on the root locus is much easier to find numerically. Recall that for a given value of the gain, okay, the closed loop holes are easily found numerically, right? We talked about that when we were designing for what the gain should be, but if you have a specific gain, it's easy to find where the poles are. Uh, software typically generates root locus plots in a brute force way by simply computing the closed loop pole locations for a range of gains. So just plugs in gains, gets out the closed loop poles, sticks them on the root locus plot, and then plugs another value of gain in there and it sticks those on there. So it just generates the root locus plot. It doesn't go through all the rules for sketching. It doesn't do any of that. It just plugs in numbers, which is, you know, computers. They can cheat like that. So. Uh, therefore, the gain corresponding to each point of these plots is then known a priori. Like, it, they chose a gain to find the closed loop pole, so they know for each closed loop pole what the gain is associated with that, because that's what they started with. Um, so, in programs such as MATLAB, the data cursor will typically display the gain corresponding to each point. So, if you just click on the root locus, it'll tell you what the gain is associated with that point, which is pretty nice. Uh, it also shows you some other information that we're going to talk about. Uh, I insufficient. Maybe I was having like a little bit of a crisis when I wrote that. Insufficient resolution. Uh, no, if. If insufficient resolution. There we go. If insufficient resolution is available. So like you can't, uh, all, you can't compute all the points numerically, right? 
if you computed all the points, it would be, be here forever. So you can't compute all the points, so you have to space them out. So maybe you don't have enough resolution in a certain place on the root locus where you want to be. So if it's not available, more can be specified. It's an optional argument, as in MATLAB's R locus command, as follows. So um, if you have a, uh, an open loop transfer function defined here, G, um, and then you said, OK, the gains that we're going to use are, are uh, logarithmically spaced from 10 to the minus 1 to 10 to the 4. Uh, and we're going to take 10,000 points, for instance, in that range. And then we're going to also put in infinity as a gain. Um, you can plot with these custom gains. You can just go ahead and, and plug it in and plot it. Um, and so let's let's pop over to MATLAB and see that. So So if we define our system g equals epk of and then negative 10, positive 10, negative 5, 5, and then negative 3. That should be a negative 20, not a positive 10. Uh, yes, good call. Yeah, I don't know where I got that. Yeah, <laughs> tomato, tomato. So that I've defined now. So if I looked at G, I would see this transfer function. And then I'm going to say k equals log space up. Well, I need to open a bracket. Also put 0 in there. It's good to have that in there. Log space of, uh, say, from minus 1. 4. 4. And then we'll put in infinity as well. So those are my gains. Then I can do figure r locus of g comma k. It'll take those gain <laughs> values and plot it for those exact gain values. And oh, every time it gets me. Every time, it really does. The window resizing glitch that is just never going to get fixed, apparently. So, um, so we're going to do this in there, and we're going to see the root locus come out, um, and we're going to look at where the gains are and all that. Come on, there we go. Does it does it remember my commands? I think it does. So we'll do G. We'll do K. And we'll do the figure. Yay! Woo! All right. So there's our root locus plot. Notice we didn't get great resolution right there at that corner, but we're probably not going to want to work there anyways. Let's say we wanted to put our closed loop hole like right here, one of them. Uh, we can see. Can you guys see? You guys can see. Uh, that the gain associated with that point is 26.2. So now you know that that is the gain in order to get your closed loop holes to be there. And you can move this along and see the different gains. So if your gain is less than, say, 4 point, uh, about 5, I guess, uh, then you're going to be potentially, uh, well, you're going to definitely be unstable. So you got to go above that, and then you know, if you come out here, you increase in gain, 95, etc. Um, there are going to be three poles here, though, right? There's going to be one in here. So keep in mind that if you're going to use a gain of say 53.1 there, then you're going to use well, that's going to take forever. Uh, oh, there it was. I just saw it. We're going to get there. Anyways, 
53.1. Ah, uh, uh, you guys, it's so touchy. Ah, <gasps> that was good. Okay, you see that, so this branch, the red one goes off here, and then that closes the pull, ends up there at 53.1 game. There's obviously going to be another pull associated with uh, this branch, and at gain of 53.1, it ends up there. So, if you were to use the second order approximation of this system and say, oh, okay, we're gonna say that all the time response characteristics are uh, just like the second order system. So for instance, we can say that the percent overshoot is related to this ray that goes out from the center. And, it's, and uh, uh, in fact, MATLAB actually shows you what that is, assuming a second order system. So the percent overshoot, for that was going to be forty or four point seven eight, yeah, four point seven eight, and four point seven eight percent is uh, assuming that it's a second order system with no zeros, right? And this, of course, is a higher order system. It's going to have three poles, closed loop poles. And what can we say about the second order approximation in this in this problem? Is it if we wanted to put our closed loop uh, uh, pull pair, like a gain of 53, um, like we have here, <coughs> is the second order approximation going to hold? Remember, there's going to be one down here too, right? Um, so 53.1. So there's going to be one there, one there, one there. If we're pretending like these two are the two dominant Pull pairs, we're assuming that. Is that a good assumption in this problem? Or is it a bad assumption? Or is it kind of like a blah assumption? Kind of meh? Kind of different. Kind of different. Okay, well, it's remember, so I know you guys are trying to remember, like, well, how the hell do you determine that? I forget. So it's, it, you determine that by deciding if these two poles are significantly to the right of the other poles, right? The other poles and zeros, if they're like five times or more to the left, they're going to have very little effect because they damp out really quickly because they, they decay really quickly, right? Uh, so this pole is going to that whole thing up, right? It's, it's to the right of them, and it's supposed to be far to the left of them. So this is going to really slow things down. If we assume this is going to be percent overshoot of 4.78, and we were to use the, the other equations for like rise time and stuff like that, settling time, it would be, they would be off um, significantly. We'll still use them. We're just going to say, oh, well, that'll get us close. Uh, but we have to recognize that it's not going to be very valid. Okay, that was enough on that. So, uh, that's how you find the gain. Pretty important. It's gonna be like really central to all of the design, finding the gain. Which brings us to proportional controller design. Oh, I guess this is a new lecture. I should start a new video, huh?